Last year, the Boston Globe published a series of articles about editing the U.S. Constitution. One of them, titled Redo the First Two Amendments, written by one Dr. Mary Ann Franks of the University of Miami School of Law, made the rounds on social media, garnering quite a bit of consternation from people who deeply care about the freedom of speech and the right to keep and bear arms. Her First Amendment rewrite specifies that people are to be subject to responsibilities for abuses of speech, and that all conflict of such rights shall be resolved in accordance with the principle of equality and dignity of all persons. What this means, I suspect, is that she wants the government to determine that any speech that runs counter to her personal ideology is an abuse and must be silenced. Her Second Amendment rewrite removes any reference to arms and weaponry whatsoever, and instead makes it more about abortion than about self-defense. Of course, she pays lip service to the idea of self-defense by stating that people have a right to defend themselves from unlawful force, but you are in fact inhibited from exercising a right to defend yourself if you are not permitted to arm yourself to do so. Of course, in her eyes, the consequence of applying logic in this fashion is to degrade the concept of self-defense. She never presents any reasoning whatsoever that justifies this rather silly claim. Plenty of others have aptly pointed out that these rewrites essentially turn the First and Second Amendments into useless garbage that do nothing to protect speech or the right to keep and bear arms. What I found was particularly egregious, however, wasn't this, but rather the philosophical framework within which she has constructed her ideas. She bemoans the aggressively individualistic ways in which the First and Second Amendments are interpreted, arguing that individual rights must always be situated within the framework of domestic tranquility and the general welfare set out in the Constitution's preamble. Of course, she never elucidates as to what domestic tranquility and the general welfare even are. I have found that the most vociferous advocates of social order and the collective good are consistent in this regard, in that they never seem to be able to coherently define what these things are. Of course, I could have ended my analysis there, but I was curious about her rationalizations. She wrote a book titled The Cult of the Constitution, Our Deadly Commitment to Guns and Free Speech, and in a talk that was hosted by the Washington and Lee University on September 17, 2020, she elucidates upon its contents. She holds that the Constitution is an instrument of white supremacy, regardless of reforms such as the abolition of slavery, universal suffrage, and the protections of the 14th Amendment. She rejects the notion that such reforms could indicate that the Constitution has been repaired so as to protect all Americans and end the domination of white male interests, and what she believes passes for evidence towards this end are demographic disparities in representation across various institutions and industries. Of course, this is laughable. I could challenge the good doctor to produce the clauses within the Constitution that mandate that the administration, any industry, the military, education, business, entertainment, or any other sector in society be dominated by white males. Of course, there are none, so she has to invent the notion that the First and Second Amendment somehow privilege white males, regardless of their fundamentally neutral language when it comes to race and gender. Even if we were to grant that the protections of the Constitution were still being unequally applied today, the results of this would not be an indictment of the Constitution itself, but rather of the people and institutions tasked with its application. As such, whether or not demographic disparities are a result of oppression or market forces has utterly no relevance whatsoever to the question of whether or not the Constitution only protects white males. The only means left to us by which to determine who is protected or excluded by the Constitution is to read its text. Since she presents no textual evidence whatsoever that proves that the document privileges white males above any other group, we can swiftly cast aside the notion that continuing social inequalities are the product of such alleged constitutional privileging.
If any aggregate differences in outcomes across the lines of race, gender, or any other identifying characteristic are due to identifiable oppression, then the fault lies within the individuals responsible for such oppression. Let them be charged with conspiracy against rights under U.S. Code Title 18, Section 241. I doubt, however, that any evidence can be produced towards this end, or that any specific individuals can be held responsible for differences in demographic representation. No causal link has ever been demonstrated proving that social disparities are necessarily the product of oppression, rather than other factors such as differences in interests, inclinations, temperaments, values, etc. Of course, she refuses to even consider the possibility that there are other explanations for social inequalities, simply stating that any explanation other than oppression cannot be true. Since we can readily reject her claim that, as written, the Constitution currently protects only the interests of white males whilst excluding all others, what can we make of the rest of her claims regarding the state of our society? Upon examination, I think that it would be clear to any rational person who took the time to hear her arguments that she possesses an utterly twisted view of the current state of affairs. She condemns and accuses of violence armed citizens peacefully protesting infringements of their civil liberties, whilst ignoring the routine and widespread violence of riots that frequently erupt from Black Lives Matter protests. As an example of these supposedly horrible, violent white men, she presents the massive gun rights rally that happened on January 20th, 2020, in Richmond, Virginia. I was there. What she leaves out is that we were there assembled peacefully. There were thousands of people there, armed to the teeth, yet no one was harmed, as the men and women of that rally conducted themselves with honor and dignity. Contrast this with the conduct of BLM, Antifa, and other political groups that this woman would align herself with. The truth is that we terrorized no one. The only reason why anyone would have anything to fear from those of us who were gathered at Richmond on that day would be if they intended to harm innocent people. This, of course, seems to me to be the most plausible explanation for her fear, as the rights of individuals are utterly unimportant in her eyes. She doesn't consider egregious violations of civil liberties to even be a constitutional matter. She minimizes and poo-poos people who actually stand up for freedom. She claims that we, as a society, are putting down people who are trying to rise up and speak about the problems in our society, and then she proceeds to advocate for putting down people such as the civil rights protesters in Richmond for trying to rise up and speak about the problems within our society. Of course, she goes on to bring up Kyle Rittenhouse, completely misrepresenting what happened at Kenosha that night, completely ignoring the fact that he was acting purely in self-defense. Violent rioting and looting is not peaceable assembly. Protecting life and property from vile thugs is not an infringement of free speech, as violence is not speech. She claims that the priorities of super spooky white males are cracking down on teaching about slavery, about how to overthrow the government, or on acknowledging BLM protests as anything other than dangerous thugs. If she would take the time to actually understand the position of her ideological opponents, she would find that we're not against teaching about slavery. What we are against is acting as if modern Americans are somehow responsible for the actions of those who came before them. The most bizarre of these claims is her supposition that we're trying to stop her from teaching people how to overthrow the government. How does she propose to overthrow the government without arms? Why should anyone seek to overthrow the government in order to abolish freedom? No answers are ever given. What is particularly hilarious about all this is that the people that she hates, the kind of people that would gather in protest against attempts to restrict the right to keep and bear arms, are the very same people who hold that it is a moral right to forcibly abolish government when it becomes destructive to liberty. 
She concludes the body of her talk by proclaiming that we ought to honor and emulate people who fight to hold democracy true to its promise of we the people. All her talk, however, about heroic people who risk their lives and reputations is disingenuous. This can be easily seen when you consider the fact that her ideas are the predominant ones within institutions, academia, the bureaucratic nightmare that is our executive branch, corporate culture, the media, entertainment, and really every echelon of power throughout our society. The true heroes, who are risking everything, who are opposed at every turn by those in power, who are actually speaking truth to power, are not on her side. During the Q&A session, immediately following her diatribe of delusion, she attempts to ground her political leanings upon what she believes to be the only justifiable way to have a moral universe. The notion that the least among you has got to be treated in the same way as the most powerful person. That regardless as to whether you frame it within the ethics of Christ as manifested in the Golden Rule, or within the ideas of Immanuel Kant in the Categorical Imperative, anything that we desire not to happen to us, we cannot justify happening to others. She does not seem to have had the introspection to realize that she explicitly advocates for people to suffer things that she would not desire to be inflicted upon her or those that she cares about. Presumably, she does not desire to be silenced. She would not appreciate her freedom to live in a fashion that is consistent with her own stated values to be stripped of her. She would probably not like it if she was prosecuted for her speech. Yet in her eyes, when people that she disagrees with merely speak, their speech constitutes violence and inflicts supposedly real harm. But when people that she agrees with riot, loot, destroy, assault, and even murder. These actions of theirs are merely speech and protest. In truth, her analysis of current events is driven not by any discernible moral principle, but rather, her conclusions are nothing more than her own caprice and prejudice. True justice is not partial. It is the vindication of the rights of the innocent, regardless as to what group those innocents may be in. It is clear that she would have us create a tiered system of justice in which any and all actions carried out by those aligned with her beliefs would be protected by force of law, regardless of whether or not those actions harm innocent people. Any actions that we would take to oppose her efforts to tyrannize us would be punished to the fullest extent of the law. And that really is one of the funniest parts of all of this. She decries the tendency to construct complex justifications for ideologies of supremacy, subordination, and domination. Yet this is quite transparently her goal. She seeks supremacy in that she desires that her values be at the forefront of society. She seeks the subordination of any who would resist her puritanical mindset's imposition upon the rest of us. And to do so, she requires dominion. It is clear that whenever she speaks of the community, she does not include within her definition those individuals who do not wish to live in accordance with her dictates. We are not a part of her community, so our interests simply don't matter to her. We possess no rights. We are to be trampled underfoot in the pursuit of her implicit goal to make serfs and slaves of all. This elucidates the true meaning of her claim, that rights must be situated within the framework of the general welfare. Society, if it is to be defined as anything at all, can only be intelligibly defined as a group of individuals. Without individuals, you have no society. As such, to detach the needs of society from the needs of individuals, to act as if society was some organism in its own right with its own unique needs that supersede the needs of individuals, is to conclude that individuals are to society what a skin cell is to a human body. The needs of a skin cell are subservient to the needs of the body. Likewise, it seems that in the mind of Dr. Franks, the needs of human beings are subservient to what she believes are the needs of society at large. Of course, since society is not an organism in its own right, but rather is nothing more than a large collection of individuals, what Dr. Franks is actually saying is that individuals possess no rights whatsoever, other than the supposed right to conform with and obey her professed ideals and values. 
Those of us who wish to say the things that she doesn't like are a tumor on the body of society, and ultimately, the only means by which she could possibly achieve her vaunted general welfare is through the excision of those of us who refuse to live in accordance to that which she believes to be its dictates. Understood this way, domestic tranquility means submission to a regime that imposes her utterly baseless desires, and the general welfare means prosperity only for people that she personally wants to see thrive at the expense of any who do not abide by her beliefs. When she references the preamble in support of her collectivist doctrine, she interprets notions such as the general welfare in a fashion that is completely disjoint from the philosophical ideals that the founders were operating under. The foundational tenet, the fundamental principle that our forebears justified their revolution by, was the notion found within the Declaration of Independence that the birthright of human beings is to live free to pursue their happiness. This is further echoed in the preamble itself, where it reads that the people of the United States established the Constitution not only to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare, but most importantly, to secure the blessings of liberty. Welfare, or well-being, is dependent upon personal autonomy. If you are not free to pursue happiness, then you are not free to improve your well-being. If people in your society in general are not free, then they are, overall, unable to achieve that which is properly understood to be the general welfare. Of course, such is lost upon the minds of those who have been taught by state-run schools that welfare is a government program rather than a state of human flourishing. If you gained something of value from watching this video, and if you would like to see more content like this in the future, subscribe and hit the bell. I intend to continue releasing content like this, because I believe that the ideas of liberty should be propagated, and that they are worth fighting for.